Well, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and welcome to Selkirk. My name is David Parker. I'm the leader of Scottish Borders Council and it's my privilege and honour to welcome here today the Scottish Cabinet and our First Minister. Can I say that 2014 is indeed a historic and significant year for Scotland. We have a very significant year of homecoming events where Scotland will be celebrated the length and breadth of the land and a range of unique events. We have the Commonwealth Games coming to Glasgow and Borders of course took part in the tremendous iconic images of the Batten coming to the Scottish Borders over the Coldstream Bridge recently and I know that last week when the Batten toured the Borders it was welcomed everywhere and very much enjoyed. We have the Ryder Cup where Europe and the USA will battle it out at Glen Eagles later on this year and of course we have that very important independence referendum, the decision on Scotland's future that we will all be discussing here today. Can I say at the outset it's absolutely fantastic to see so many borderers here in Selkirk. The Cabinet are back here for the second time in a year, which is unprecedented for the Cabinet to visit our region in such quick succession. They did so because they had such a tremendous reception from borderers in Hoyk last year, and I know that this year you'll want to give them a tremendous reception here in Selkirk. Now, Scottish Borders Council works with the Cabinet on a range of very significant issues, and I just want to highlight some of these to you. At the moment, the Council, in partnership with government, are delivering a network of two and three G pitches in towns such as Peebles, Selkirk, Hoyk, Gala Shields, Kelso and in Jedburgh. We are delivering next generation broadband with the government, which will see 97% of homes in the Scottish Borders connected to high-speed broadband by, 90, by, by 2017. We're delivering the Borders Railway, that very significant £350 million project which will significantly regenerate our region. In, in Jedburgh and Gala Shields, we're delivering a flood protection scheme and here in Selkirk later on today, the Minister will unveil the £30 million flood defence scheme for Selkirk, 80% funded by Scottish Government. We've seen the development of Abbotsford House and we've seen significant investment in affordable housing. And this morning, as your council leader, I was given the unique opportunity to address cabinet and to highlight to them a range of other projects that the government can deliver for the borders working with us in partnership. Colleagues I can say without fear of contradiction that the investment from government working with the council in our region has never been at higher levels than it is today. So without any further ado can I thank, can I thank the Scottish cabinet and first minister on your behalf for their attendance here today and can I hand over to local MSP Walt Paul Wheelhouse the minister for environment and climate change who will talk us through Proceedings. Paul. Thank you for that uh, warm introduction, uh, Councillor Parker. Ladies and gentlemen, as David has said, uh, welcome, good afternoon. I am Paul Wheelhouse, Minister for Environment and Climate Change. My cabinet colleagues and I are delighted to be here in the Royal Borough of Selkirk and specifically in the Victoria Halls for the sixth in a series of cabinet meetings held around Scotland to discuss our country's future. The referendum on the 18th of September is a choice between two futures. The First Minister and the entire cabinet are committed to ensuring that the people of Scotland have all the information they need to make their choice. That is why in the run-up to the referendum, the Cabinet is holding meetings right across Scotland to give you, the people of Scotland, the chance to question the First Minister and Cabinet on our proposals for an independent Scotland. But the questions needn't just be about independence. We're here to answer any questions you have about the work of the Scottish Government. As well as these Cabinet events, individual Cabinet Secretaries are also holding public question and answer sessions uh, on Scotland's future, and to date we have held 34 such events. New venues are being added to the events section of the Scottish Government's referendum website, scottreferendum.com, and there are details in the packs left on your seats. In a moment, you will have the opportunity to hear from the First Minister. Uh, once the First Minister has spoken, uh, we will then open up to take your questions for about an hour, and following the formal session, we hope you'll be able to stay uh, with us for a cup of tea and a biscuit here in the main hall, uh, where you'll be able to continue the discussions with individual ministers, if you wish. Uh, so without further ado, will you please give a warm welcome to the First Minister of Scotland, Alex Salmond. Can I, uh, 
can I, can I thank uh, Paul and uh, also David, and I'm absolutely delighted to be here uh, in Selkirk. Uh, as David was saying, this is our, our second visit to the borders as a cabinet this year, but it's our third uh, since uh, 2007. Uh, we've been in uh, Hoyk, we've been uh, here in Selkirk, uh, and we've also been in Melrose. Uh, so that's three visits uh, since 2007. In contrast, the United Kingdom cabinet has been in Scotland three times in the last century. <laughs> uh, <laughs> indeed, the last time, uh, coincidentally, of course, nothing to do with this year being the year of the referendum, uh, they met in Aberdeen uh, earlier this year. And on the day they met in Aberdeen behind the security and Shell Oil's headquarters, uh, the Scottish cabinet were meeting in Port Lethen in a, uh, in a church hall in a question and answer session rather similar to this. Well, I thought it was a neat uh, kind of contrast between the, uh, between the two cabinets and our, our approach to, uh, to doing business. Uh, so we'll certainly get round the, the other great boroughs of the, the borders over the next uh, year or two. But in a way, of course, all the, the, the borders boroughs are here in the, in the Victoria Hall, aren't they? Uh, I mean, there's a gala up uh, there. Uh, Gala is, uh, of course, the, the banners are here because of the celebrations of the, of the common ridings. But Gala's sewer plumes, uh, I'm told, and I thank Alistair and Paul, your hall keepers, your excellent hall keepers here in the Victoria Hall for supplying me with all this information. I mention that just in case I make a mistake, in which case it's all <laughs> Alistair uh, and Paul's fault. But they've supplied me with all of the information I require to go around the, the, the banners of the, the great towns and boroughs of the, the borders. Sewer plume, raiding party of English, discomforted. Uh, by eating sewer plumes, were attacked and defeated by Gala men in 1337. Uh, there's peoples, uh, uh, as you see, the, the Latin, and I know you all did Latin at school here in Selka, you know, absolutely fantastic. Uh, well, peoples, of course, uh, their secondus means uh, second to none, uh, or uh, I'm never second, uh, as I hear it. My wife's from peoples, I don't know if I should mention that to you, or uh, she puts it, don't ever treat me a second, ever. <laughs> And then there's Duns, Dun Dings All. Uh, there's Melrose, Truth and Loyalty. In a leaf and uh, Live and Let Live, actually, uh, it was written here as Lie and Let Live, but I know for a fact it's uh, Live and Let Live or Watch and Pray. Uh, Jedburgh, Strength and Prosperity. Musselburgh, Honest, hence the, the Honest Town. A, a fantastic town motto for a town with a race course, don't you feel, ladies and gentlemen? <laughs> Uh, Pennycook, uh, of course, is uh, Penwickock, uh, that's Welsh for Cuckoo on the Hill. Kelso, plain and simple. Uh, Hoyek, Tiribus uh, de Tir de Odin. Uh, may the gods keep us both Thor and Odin. I think there might be a bit of Norse in, uh, in Hoyek. Uh, I'll have to ask my wee sister about that. She stays in Hoyek. <laughs> Uh, and the Selkirk banner, of course, ain't here. That, that's because I'm told that the, the Selkirk banner would take up the whole <laughs> of, the, of the stage. Uh, which, uh, so obviously things are in the right proportion here in Selkirk uh, compared to the, the other boroughs. But the, the flower of the forest uh, uh, defend her honour at the cost of life itself, uh, which of course echoes the declaration of her brove. Uh, the honour, not honours, honour, uh, is what no good person gives up but with life itself. Whether Selkirk sourced it from the Declaration of Abroth or the Declaration of Abroth sourced it from Selkirk uh, is another question. But we are delighted, all of us, to be here uh, in the borders. And before I, I, I begin, I just want to highlight the, the tartan that every member of the cabinet uh, is wearing. Uh, the case of, t well, apart from Mr. Russell. <laughs> And Mr. Russell's education sector, and he's just gone to the bottom of the class. <laughs> Every other member of the cabinet is sporting, and uh, uh, apart from the, the two ladies who didn't bring their tartan scarves, uh, which they were given upstairs, every other member of the cabinet, <laughs> with the uh, exception of Shona and Nicola and Mr. Russell, uh, is wearing the tartan tie uh, of, uh, uh, of the... Uh, the Commonwealth of the uh, Ryder Cup, uh, and the point is, we don't normally coordinate uh, the outfits quite so carefully, but of course the, the Ryder Cup tartan was made in Loch Carn, or designed here in Selkirk, made here in Selkirk, and put, chosen by Paul McGinley, uh, the European uh, side captain. So the, the Ryder Cup, uh, in uh, a month or two, you'll see that the European team are adorned with this tartan, which reflects both the saltire 
uh, and uh, the European flag. And a beautiful tartan it is, and it gives us the opportunity in that huge international event uh, to promote a great local Selkirk product. And of course, Selkirk, as David mentions, already been part of the, the build-up for one of the other great events of 2014. And the Commonwealth Baton really passed through here, as I understand it, last Wednesday. And two weeks ago, these halls, of course, played the, a crucial part in the, the great common riding. The busting of the colours took place the night before the morn, and on the day of the riding, the standard bearers were installed in the balcony of this building, including Fiona Deacon, the first ever female standard bearer, and Greg McDougall, the Royal Standard Bearer. Uh, I noticed, incidentally, in passing, that the Standard Bearers were installed at 6.45, having been roused at four in the morning. And unless you, you find that impressive, can I just say the marches in Livgay, my hometown, it's 5.45 and three in the morning that we start. <laughs> <laughs> but when the, the Royal Borough Standard Bearer spoke in these halls in the night before the morning, he wondered, where else can you find such community spirit but here in Selkirk on Common Riding Week? And we're getting a real sense of that community spirit from the visits here and across the borders that the cabinet is undertaking today uh, and also from the well, warm welcome that we're receiving. So it's a pleasure to be here for this uh, 30th discussion around Scotland since this cabinet came into being in 2007 uh, and the third in the Scottish borders. Now, the purpose of the discussions, of course, is not just for me to make points to you. The purpose of the discussion is for you to ask questions. Uh, and of course, tactically, it's a grand idea uh, to assemble the, the cabinet team here with me. Uh, obviously, if I'm asked a relatively simple question, uh, I'll bloot it out of the park. If, if the question is difficult or challenging, then I shall delegate the responsibility <laughs> <laughs> to one of these uh, excellent people raised before you. But one of the great things about taking the, the cabinet around the country and coming to towns uh, across Scotland is that we get uh, the chance to make some of the announcements which have a particular local relevance. Uh, it's actually one of the reasons why it's a grand idea to make sure your town or borough hosts the cabinet, incidentally. And I want to cover four of the ones that are being announced and discussed today. Later today, Paul Wheelhouse will be down at Victoria Park cutting the first sod in the flood prevention works in Selkirk. It's a £31 million scheme, 80% of the funding from the Scottish Government, 20% from Scottish Borders Council. It will protect 600 houses and business premises from flooding. Many of you here will remember the serious damage in the 2003 and 2004 floods, or the 1977 flood. Well, actually, not too many of you here will remember the 1970 flood which destroyed the old Stain Bridge over Ettrick Water. And therefore, you'll understand how important that work is. Well, Paul's at uh, Victoria Park. I I'm going to Spark Energy, which is receiving a £200,000 grant from Scottish Enterprise. 18 months ago, Spark employed 100 people here in Selkirk. Now it has just over 200, and it's reaching its 100,000th customer. Scottish Enterprise's help will make it and help it to grow further and to employ even more people in this area. Spark Enterprise is one, of course, of the, the energy companies, Spark, which is uh, opening up the energy market to, to real competition in a very specific area, but nonetheless a hugely important development. But it is the only one of the kind of these new companies coming into the energy market, uh, which is headquartered uh, in a town such as Selkirk. And then that makes it all the more valuable in terms of the economic impact that it has. Uh, this morning, I visited the Eildon Housing Association. Eildon established in 1973, now responsible for more than 2,000 houses across the borders. I visited the New Eastern Langley Development in Ghana. The Scottish Government announced today we're providing a further £800,000 for Eildon to purchase land next to Eastern Langley so they can provide more homes in the area and more homes for working people, for ordinary families, uh, which is the priority of that housing association's development. Uh, yesterday, I announced plans to involve people from the, the borders of Midlovian in planning the, the celebrations for the opening of the Waverley Nine next year. Uh, and there is uh, an absolute connection. I, I believe the reopening of the railway it will be a pathway to regeneration, both economic and tourist development of this area of Scotland. I think the, there will be the most extraordinary boom in the housing market along that line. And I think it's absolutely vital 
that as these developments take place, they include affordable housing uh, for people who live and work in these communities so they can have access to that prosperity. There'll be improved bus links to ensure that towns such as Selkirk, not directly on the railway, but close to it, get the maximum benefit. That tourist potential is going to be extraordinary. And I met uh, David and I was highly impressed that the leader of your council gets up at half past seven in the morning for these early morning meetings. I have to say I demurred slightly. I got there at quarter to eight, but nonetheless, he was there uh, at half past seven and we were looking, we were looking at Tweed Bank uh, and what can be done to make sure we get the maximum benefit uh, in terms of what I believe will be the most extraordinary tourist line in Scotland and one of the most extraordinary lines in Europe. It is, of course, being built essentially as a communications for people on the borders into Edinburgh. But nonetheless, the tourist potential of that line is extraordinary. Why? Because uh, other tourist lines, the West Highland Line, for example, are gobsmackingly beautiful. This is gobsmackingly beautiful, and it's 55 minutes from the largest railway station in Scotland, where there are a million visitors each year through Edinburgh who will have the opportunity to see the glory of, of the borders in a space of 55 minutes. And for this community and the communities around the borders to take advantage of that opportunity, to make sure that these people get the opportunity to visit, to see, to spend, uh, and to see the great produce of the borders. And that's a project on which the Borders Council and the government will be working to make sure we take the absolute full advantage from the transformational effect of that railway line. Now, ladies and gentlemen, these are important local initiatives and opportunities. Uh, I want to say something, however, about the national opportunity which awaits us on September the 18th. And I want to make three points. Firstly, about Scot why Scotland can be independent. <laughs> Secondly, about why we should be independent. Uh, and above all, about why, in my estimation, we must be an independent country. So let's take these in turn. I want to give you a, a quotation. Here's the quotation. Supporters of independence will always be able to cite examples of small, independent and thriving economies such as Finland, Switzerland and Norway. It would be wrong to suggest that Scotland could not be another such successful independent country. That's a quotation from David Cameron, uh, the Prime Minister of these islands. It may be a reason why he's so keen not to debate with me, incidentally. <laughs> he doesn't want that quotation. Now, despite the fact that I don't agree with David too much about just about anything, but nonetheless, that is a, an example of the Prime Minister being caught telling the truth. Uh, and there we are in that quotation, the essential sense of the proposition about Scottish independence. He didn't mention, of course, that in terms of production per head, Finland does about 10% better than the UK, Switzerland 50% better, Norway 85% better, but nonetheless, it was a very reasonable point to make, that across Europe there are many examples uh, of countries which are successful, indeed more successful, than the UK as small independent countries. The rating agency Moody's recently concluded, quote, all possible outcomes point to Scotland being among the wealthiest sovereign countries in the world, unquote. Standard & Poor's, another rating agency, and can I just say rating agencies are not known for their sunny, optimistic view of the world <laughs> or, or companies or countries, but Standard & Poor's, the other major rating agency, said, quote, Scotland had a wealthy economy, high-quality human capital, flexi product and flexible product and labour markets, transparent institutions, even without North Sea oil, it would qualify for our highest economic assessment. So on any reasonable assessment, we can be an independent country. But the question to be answered on 18th September is not really can we be an independent country. The question is should we be an independent country. And the argument for that, in my estimation, rests on a very simple, basic proposition. And that is that the best people, the very best people to take decisions about the future of Scotland are the people who live and work in this country. No one else, no one else anywhere will take better decisions than the people who've invested their future and their family's future in a country. In the Scottish Parliament, there's a, a wall of quotations uh, along the Cannon Gate in the Royal Mile. Uh, and there's one from uh, Sir Walter Scott, who of course was sheriff here in Selkirk for almost 30 years. It's by Mrs. Howden in the heart of uh, Midlovian. Uh, incidentally, uh, I was thinking that Heart of Midlovian 
might be a good name uh, for the, uh, the train, uh, the, you know, the steam. <laughs> but I, I've been vetoed by the rest of the cabinet uh, and by the justice secretary, that Hibs supporter among us. <laughs> uh, but nonetheless, I am sure that they'll come forward a suitable name, perhaps echoing the uh, Waverley novels or, or some of Walter Scott's great work for that train. But in Heart of Lovian, Mrs. Howden says, when we had a king and a chancellor and a parliament or reign, we could I people them with stains when they were not good bairns, but nobody's nails can reach the length of London. Uh, in other words, uh, she reckoned that the great advantage of having an independent parliament was to chuck stains at the parliamentarians. <laughs> now, I like that quote. Uh, I should stress, as you have to do in these uh, days of correctness, uh, I'm not actually advocating the uh, flinging stones at the parliamentarians, but there is something uh, essentially true, is there not, in the idea that closeness brings uh, accountability, like the Scottish Cabinet coming to the borders three times in the last seven years, or the UK Parliament Cabinet coming to Scotland three times in the last century. The research came out just at the weekend from the, the Social Attitude Survey. That's not a, an, an opinion poll. Social Attitude Survey is the the most detailed piece of research that comes out on an annual and biannual basis about public attitudes. And it looked at the public attitudes in Scotland towards the Scottish government on the one hand and the UK government on the other. And the Scottish government is trusted by 59% of the people of Scotland. Now, some of you may think that's too high. I've got a feeling it's a bit low myself. But it compares with 26% who trust the UK government on the same measurement. Uh, so the Scottish government is trusted by more than twice the number of people who trust the United Kingdom government. I think that 26% is too high if you ask me, but nonetheless, if we take a side and try to move aside from the particular parties or personalities involved, surely the, the trust comes from proximity and closeness and the fact that people know whatever mistakes or we make or don't make, uh, that the Scottish Government has as its priority the welfare of people in Scotland. And what is echoed in that figure is the knowledge that that is the priority of the Scottish Government. You know, rough hue issues how we will. That is the priority that the Government has. And it's maybe not surprising the Scottish Parliament over the last 15 years has been discovered to deliver in Scottish interests. All members of the Scottish Parliament represent parts of Scotland. 9% of MPs at Westminster do. So the Scottish Parliament has introduced measures which match that priority and live up to that trust. For example, in personal care for the elderly, free university and college tuition, the ban on smoking in public places, the most ambitious climate change targets in the world. And when I mention that, people say, oh, but haven't you missed? these climate change targets for the last three years. Yes, we have. But we are still the third best in Europe, not just hugely better than anywhere else in these islands, but third in Europe at 29% reduction in CO2 emissions towards our 42% target, just behind Denmark, just behind Finland, but better than anywhere else because we've set an ambitious target and we did it unanimously as a parliament. So, just looking at two of the announcements I mentioned earlier. <clears throat> They're about local projects, but they make a point about national issues. That's Spark Energy announcement first. Spark moved to Ettrick Riverside from Edinburgh because it was a facility in Selkirk owned by Scottish Enterprise. Scottish Enterprise have supported the company from the beginning and have pointed out that a more efficient, cost-effective location would be good for a business which was trying to bring about efficient, cost-effective prices in an energy market which is notorious for its lack of full competition. Uh, last year, our enterprise agencies have supported more than 120 companies across the Scottish borders. Now, if you want a contrast, <clears throat> and the contrast doesn't lie with uh, regional development from the UK government in Scotland because it doesn't do any. But three years ago, the United Kingdom government scrapped its regional development agencies across the north of England as a cost-cutting measure, and they have suffered directly as a result. I was watching George Osborne yesterday, 
Rekha Sweet saying he wanted to revive the north of England. He actually talking about Manchester, but nonetheless, he said, I want to revive the north of England. Three years ago, they scrapped the agencies who were responsible for attracting investment to the north of England. Actually, two years ago, George Osborne told uh, BBC Scotland in Aberdeen, and he said he knew the uncertainty about the referendum was damaging inward investment into Scotland. Of course, he also said that he as Chancellor was doing his absolute best, working night and day to dissuade these international investors from being worried about the referendum. Over the last three years, we've achieved the best ever record of inward investment projects into Scotland in the Ernst & Young survey, the highest since 1977 and higher than any part of these islands out with London itself. So either you believe that George Orburn working night and day for our interests internationally was successful in calming people's fears, or you believe his actual objective was to stir up fears in Scotland in the first place, an objective in which he failed. And if we don't believe him about the last two years, then why should we believe him about the next 20 years? The talent of our people, the quality of life in Scotland, the government commitment to skills and infrastructure, these are what have brought companies to Scotland, and these are the same commitments which will allow companies like Spark to grow within our communities in Scotland. So all that raises a question of having a parliament, having powers in Scotland has been good for Scotland over the things that the parliament controls, like industrial development, like exports, like the health service, like the education system. Why shouldn't independence be better? And then there's the housing announcement, the £800,000 for Eildon Housing Association. That's part of a, a much bigger programme of spending. Since the last election in Scotland, the government have just passed the billion pound mark. That's a thousand million pounds in social and affordable housing in Scotland. By 2016, the figure will be 1.7 billion and we'll have delivered 30,000 new affordable homes across Scotland. That is twice the level of affordable social housing build that happens in England and Wales over that period of time. Per head of population, it's twice the level. You know, I hear that uh, the uh, interest rates are going to go up because of the uh, London housing bubble. Uh, and what a nightmare it is for the rest of the country that's going to, to happen. Uh, and yet, isn't the solution to housing bubble to build more houses? <laughs> And this is the solution to housing bubble to build affordable houses so that people don't get subjected to the vagaries of the interest rate, which is what we've been trying to do in Scotland. So if we've been doing it, then why isn't that good enough? Well, the answer lies in a report from the Institute of Fiscal Study. It pointed out that we spend twice as much on social housing, and that's good as far as it goes. People are more likely to get affordable homes but it also demonstrates one of the reasons why we must be independent. The Institute of Fiscal Studies pointed out uh, that Scotland, having done the spending, the Scottish Government has said, is bearing the cost of greater investment in social housing and lower rents, while the benefits of that spending in terms of housing benefit accrue to the UK Government. Uh, because the social housing, the affordable housing, means that housing benefit rates are less than they would be, and that is expenditure saved by the UK government because of spending the Scottish government does. What is the UK government's response to the runaway uh, budget in terms of housing benefit? It was to impose the bedroom tax. Imposing the bedroom tax, which is then something we've had to spend 50 million pounds in Scotland trying to undo the damage off because people across Scotland were being unfairly penalized across Scotland and in the borders. So now we're being told that uh, well, actually, all along, the other parties were promising to devolve more power to Scotland. Uh, and as the Labour leader in Scotland put it just last week, her colleagues in the Conservative Party, which I love that phrase, her colleagues in the Conservative Party were standing shoulder to shoulder uh, and deciding to have more powers for Scotland. And of course, the fact that the referendums in September the 18th is totally coincidental uh, to the fact that this offer of more powers is coming forward. There's two problems with it. I was saying that a lot of folk here wouldn't remember the floods of 1977, but I suspect there's a lot of folk here remember the promises of 1979. And remember who my mother 
thought was the finest Conservative Prime Minister uh, that she ever voted for, Sir Alec Douglas Hume, a calibre and cut above many other Conservative Prime Ministers that, that I could mention, but it was Sir Alec Douglas Hume who said, uh, and uh, said very clearly, that if Scotland voted no in 1979, uh, then a better Parliament would come from the Conservative Party. Scotland actually voted yes, narrowly, and we've got 18 years of Margaret Thatcher and John Major's Conservative government and no powers devolved whatsoever. So having been encouraged to vote no once and nothing delivered, I doubt if anybody who remembers that experience will be fooled uh, again. There is another argument, of course, and I call it the, I call it the childcare test. One of the initiatives we've been taking, which is proving to be very successful, is providing a change in childcare arrangements to allow more women to participate in the, the workforce. Uh, 33,000 more women are working in Scotland this year than last year, most of them in full-time employment. The employment rate among women in Scotland is touching 70%, which is much, much higher than elsewhere in the UK. And out with the Scandinavian countries, one of the highest rates in the whole of Europe. So what is it about the Scandinavian countries which allow them to get 75% of women participating in the workforce and not have people losing uh, their opportunity and skills uh, because of the cost and affordability of childcare? It's because they produce childcare, which is effectively the same as primary education and flexible and means that people don't have to lose their opportunity to participate in the workforce. Now, if we do that in Scotland, and we intend to in an independent Scotland, then that will generate lots of income. Uh, we believe that if you increase female participation in the workforce, it will generate £700 million a year in terms of the taxes that people pay because they get into employment, employers' national insurance, employees' national insurance, the VAT, the spending, everything that comes from people working and contributing to prosperity. So the question is, well, why don't you just do that now? You know, why don't you just spend that 700, 800 million and start that process of transforming childcare? Well, of course, we're moving uh, to 600 hours this year. We're moving to start the process of offering childcare to many families of two-year-olds in Scotland. But why can't we move to that transformation of having childcare available in the same way from the age of two as the primary education at the present moment? Well, the answer is very simple. It's a question of affordability. Because that's 700 million, that's the extra money that would be generated by allowing that increase in female participation in the workforce under the current arrangements. That's 700 million, 600 million of it goes straight into the coffers of the Treasury. Because Scotland only controls 12% of the taxation base of the country. So 90%, nine tenths of it, goes to George Osborne in the Treasury in London. Now, I've known George Osborne for a number of years, and I can absolutely promise you neither in terms of the revenue generated by the additional 33,000 women who are now working this year compared to last year, or the additional 60,000 that we believe is possible over a period of time, that's 700 million pounds of additional revenue. If it comes to George Osborne, I can promise you the very last thing in his mind will be, I shall return 600 million pounds to Scotland to allow them to make their childcare expansion affordable. I promise you that will be the last of his priorities. And every policy and every offer from the unionist parties should be matched against that childcare test. How much of control of revenue will it bring to Scotland to allow policies to grow the economy and make us more prosperous and more just? How much will be controlled in Scotland and how much will be controlled in London? It's a test which the unionist parties will not be able to meet. Ladies and gentlemen, we set out a couple of weeks ago a plan to, to make this society, this country, more prosperous, using the full powers of independence in order to achieve that ambition. It's not something that we're saying can be done in a day, a week, a month, or a year. We are not saying, we are absolutely not saying, that the day after independence we'll all wake up with three taps, whiskey, oil, water. That's not going to happen. Nobody is going to give it to us on a plate. Equally, I promise you, the seven plagues of agent will not descend upon this benighted country if we vote for independence. That's what the, the Better Together campaign's inspiring messages 
uh, to the people of Scotland. Neither of these things will happen. What I say is this, if we set our objective as a society to increasing participation in the workforce, for rebalancing the working age population, meeting the challenge that all of Western Europe faces of the demographics of an aging population and how we get more people into the workplace, how we offer opportunity to the 30,000 young Scots who leave Scotland every year, how we offer an incentive for the people who've left Scotland in previous generations to come back and build businesses and reunite with their families. Many want to. How we offer skilled people that we educate for four years and give them the opportunity, because they want to, to contribute to this country, to help build this country. If we do that and we increase the number of jobs and if we remove the obstacles and barriers to women to be in the workforce, if we do all of these three things and raise the productivity of this economy, then over a period of 15 years, then each family will be £2,000 a year better off if we work together as a country to make these achievements possible. If we don't do it, if we don't have these powers, then I dare say the Scottish Parliament will do the best it can. But I tell you, do not look 600 miles south for the inspiration or the belief in how this country could develop. If that was going to happen, it would have happened generations ago. If I was to pick one single statistic out of the many I could to illustrate the full disappointment, the lost opportunity of London management, the Scottish economy, it'd be a very simple one. In the whole of the 20th century, between 1901 and 2001, the population of Scotland increased by 6%, by almost 10%, I beg your pardon, by just under 10%. The population of England increased by 60% over that same period of time. And that differential explains the difference and the lost opportunity to develop this nation over that period of time. Now, since the Scottish Parliament came into to being, that trend has been reversed. But if we are to respond to the challenges of the future, we need the powers required to make sure this country continues to develop and grow. And finally, ladies and gentlemen, in this debate, uh, we hear a lot about sovereignty. What does sovereignty mean? Uh, well, sovereignty is self-determination. It's taking charge of your own destiny. It's having an impact on your surroundings, your community, your town, your country. It's being able to choose the future. It's the sovereignty. It's the ability of people to make that choice. And we're told that, you know, this is the most important decision Scotland's made for 300 years except that Scotland didn't make the decision 300 years ago. This actually is the first expression of sovereignty in Scotland. For a millennium, we've had a theory in Scotland of uh, the people are sovereign. We invented it, actually, in the early Middle Ages, the idea that it was something beyond the, the king, the nobility. It was something called the community of the realm. It was an inspiration for other countries and other places, not least of which the United States of America. But in this country which invented popular sovereignty, we have on the September the 18th the first opportunity to participate in it. And when each of us goes into the polling station on that day, then we'll take the future of our country into our hands. And the great thing about it is the richest family in the country will have the same number of votes as the poorest family in the country. Everyone, every single person will be equal before that ballot box. And when we go into that polling station, that will be not Scotland's greatest challenge or decision for 300 years. It'll be the first time in our history that we have the ability to express that sovereignty. It's an opportunity which uh, is not unique. One or two other countries have had it, but it is very rare and very precious in the world. We have the opportunity to do it through a peaceful process, an agreed, consented process of democratic development. It's a chance that many countries would give their eye teeth for. It's an opportunity that many countries have had to fight for. And we have it as a democratic expression. It's an opportunity and a chance we should not miss because it's an opportunity worth having. Which is why I've got every confidence in September the 18th, the people of this country, including these great communities in the borders, will seize it with both hands. Thank you very much.
Thank, thank you, First Minister. Uh, we'll now move to the uh, question and answer session. And on stage today, if I just uh, introduce my colleagues, we have, uh, firstly, obviously, Alex Salmon, First Minister of Scotland. We have uh, to uh, Mr. Salmon's left, we have Nicola Sturgeon, who is the Deputy First Minister and Cabinet Secretary for Infrastructure. We have uh, Mr. John Swinney, uh, just to the left of Nicola, uh, Cabinet Secretary for Finance and Sustainable Growth. And uh, to the rear of John, we have Mr. Hamza Youssef, uh, Minister for External Affairs and International Development. Uh, next to Hamza, we have Kenny McCaskill, who's the Cabinet Secretary for Justice. Uh, Mr. Mackay, Director Mackay, who's the uh, Minister for Local Government and Planning. And behind me, uh, Mr. Michael Russell, who's the uh, Cabinet Secretary for Education and Lifelong Learning. And uh, to my immediate left, uh, Mr. Alex Neal, who's the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Wellbeing. And to uh, Alex left, uh, Shona Robeson, who's the Cabinet Secretary for Commonwealth Games, uh, Sport, Equalities and Pensioners' Rights. I will take questions in batches of three uh, and then invite the First Minister and other members of the Cabinet to respond. Uh, I believe we have some questions on Twitter. I've got problems with my phone, so I'm relying on colleagues to supply them to me. Uh, if we can, we'll fit in questions from Twitter as well today uh, for those who are unable to make the event, and I'll try to include as many of them as possible. We normally have many more questions than time available. Uh, so if you have a question, I'd urge you to get your hand up straight away when we start. Uh, and please avoid, if you can, uh, giving any lengthy preamble uh, so that we can get as many questions in, in the time available as possible. And uh, if you could keep your questions short, that'd be much appreciated. But if we don't get to you today, don't worry. There are forms in every seat, uh, which you should have seen when you arrived, where you can write down your question and place them in the boxes at the back of the room uh, at the end. And every question will get a written reply if we're unable to pick up your question today. So let's, let's make a start. Uh, can I can ask that you raise your hand if you have a question and uh, wait until the microphone reaches you. Can you please give your name, if possible, uh, before asking your question? And if you are asking on behalf of an organization, I would kind I kindly ask you to just let us know who they are because that might help my colleagues uh, frame the response accordingly. So uh, if we can take, uh, we've got a number of their hands up here. Uh, if we take the, the lady who had her hand up first just in the stripy jumper, it's behind you, sir. And then we've got uh, two gentlemen at the front and then I'll come to the others in the second batch. I'm a grandmother of seven and I would like to know how an independent Scotland would enable children from lower income families to flourish go on to higher education when the level of student debt at the moment is so high. Thank you for your question. And then we've got the two gentlemen in front. We've got the uh, man in the striped shirt, Barry Forrest, and then, and then yourself, sir, after that. Hello, I'm Barry Forrest. I'm on Reston Community Council, which is in Berwickshire. I'm also vice chairman of Rages Rail Action Group East of Scotland. Um, what I would like to know is, um, we're near the border in Berwickshire. How are we going, how is the pound going to affect you? Are we still going to have a pound in one pocket or are we going to have to another different uh, money in another pocket? Another thing I want to say just before I finish, um, you spoke, First Minister, very well about the borders really, which I'm thoroughly pleased to hear about. But we at the moment in Berwickshire, we're hoping to have our station at rest and we opened. I spoke to... Keith Brown last week and the week before, and we've got the back end of the two councils, East Lothian Council, Scottish Borders Council, and I only hope that the, before the referendum starts that we can get the yes vote for rest, and which will help the borders, which is also in the borders, and uh, it's, we feel it's out of the reach at some times of the government. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And gentlemen. Russell Bruce, uh, I'm here probably in two capacities. I write for Newsnet Scotland uh, and involved in the local branch of Business for Scotland. Um, the, the Scottish Government 
is dependent on a block grant. The Cabinet Secretary for Finance, I understood, achieved 3% efficiency savings on the block grant. I wonder if he could maybe uh, peek into the sort of future with access to the full tax revenues uh, for Scotland. What would his target be for efficiency savings? And can he perhaps suggest some areas that m might be ripe for a little bit uh, of of, of pruning to produce some significant savings because uh, uh, he has a, he's a pretty good record on, bal on balancing the books. Thank you for that. So we have first question on Stuart. Uh, uh, can I ask uh, Mike Russell to, to, to pick up the grandmother's point about, uh, about, the, uh, about children in terms of the education, in terms of student debt? And then I'm going to ask. Uh, John, could you answer Russell's question about uh, are you a good pruner or, or, or not? Uh, and then I'm going to answer Barry's question uh, 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 about uh, Reston and uh, yes for Reston. Uh, uh, so we we'll start with you, Mike. Uh, uh, children, particularly from poorer backgrounds, be able to afford it going to education. One of the scariest statistics I know comes from America and what's happening south of the border in education, in higher education, with the debt that's growing all the time, it's going in the same direction as America, where now debt for education is higher than credit card debt. If you just think about that, what people owe on education is higher than credit card debt. And in America, that means that the only subjects that are worth studying for anybody are those subjects that actually pay a lot of money, because you have to pay that debt back. Now, we've got to avoid that, and the way we've avoided that so far, we've got to go on avoiding it, is to have free access to higher education. Um, the latest figures on debt show that the debt of Scottish students is less than a third of the debt of students south of the border, and indeed, that's before the £9,000 a year tuition fees are counted in. So we've got to keep student debt as low as possible. That's one, and that comes from free education. And it's absolutely essential we keep stick with education based on the ability to learn, not the ability to pay. So that's the first thing we've got to do. But for the poorest students and the poorest backgrounds, we've got to recognize something that has been too true all over the world. And it's something described by the Ontario educationalist, Davis Glaze, as poverty being destiny in educational terms. That means essentially how well you do at school and what opportunities you get arise from where you come from. Now, that's not just an educational problem. That's a problem for the whole of society. That's to do with poverty. And what we've got to do is to have a society that bears down and eliminates poverty. And you can't do that just with educational tools. The tools that the Scottish Parliament have at the moment are educational tools. We need the full tax, welfare, labor market powers to bear down on poverty. Because if we do that, then every child will have a fair opportunity when they go to school, when they go through school, when they go to college, or when they go to university. And in fact, it's even worse at the moment, because it's not just we don't have the powers in the Scottish Parliament. There are things happening south of the border, for example, all the benefit cuts, that are making the situation of poverty worse in Scotland. The Child Poverty Action Group anticipates that by 2020, there will be 100,000 more children in poverty in Scotland. So that's 100,000 more children whose educational chances are being driven down by the circumstances in which, from which they come. So independence is absolutely essential to give every child the fairest chance that they could possibly have in education. And we need to follow that up by making sure that education is free and always free and there's the widest access possible. And our universities are some of the first in the world where legally they also have to think about getting those children from poorer backgrounds into further and higher education. So we're on a good, steady course, but we need the full powers of independence to be fair to every child. John, do you want to answer? Uh, on Russell's question, first of the, the government has, since 2007, followed um, a, a very disciplined efficiency programme. It's not just been me that's been following that efficiency programme, all my colleagues have had to uh, participate and contribute fully into that, uh, that programme. You the choice, well, <laughs> there was little discretion, but uh, I, I thought I'd be generous about the willing participation of my colleagues. 
whether it was willing or not, it's a different matter, but uh, they've all done it. And we've delivered um, improvements in public services by spending money in different ways. Um, we've come to agreements with local government, for example, around uh, relaxing some of the, uh, the, the ring fencing that used to be real obstacles to the efficient and effective use of public expenditure at local level. And that's enabled local authorities to meet some of the financial challenges much more effectively. Another major reform that we put in place uh, in uh, concert with the civil service was to break down the barriers that exist within government departments and, and portfolios. And we now operate in a in a, in a, a, a boundary-free uh, environment within the operations of government, which enables us to focus on improving performance and delivering more with the resources that we've got at our disposal. But all of that shouldn't mask the fact that we are wrestling with very difficult public, uh, a very difficult public expenditure climate, and by law I'm required to balance the budget, which means that we have to take some pretty difficult decisions in arriving at that situation. So we've proved over time the, our ability as an administration to deliver um, a, a clear and prudent financial environment within which we operate. And looking at what opportunities would be available with independence, there are, there are two that come very directly to mind uh, to me. One is in relation to uh, the whole area of employability, where we do a lot of work, again, with our local authority partners and with our third sector partners in Scotland, to support people into employment, individuals who've got challenges, um, and uh, we support them into employment. And then we often collide with the welfare reform programme of the UK government and the employability of the work programme, which has got a very poor level of performance across the United Kingdom. If we could actually merge all of that together in a coherent way, which is exactly what we plan to do with independence, we could better support individuals into employment. We could do it, I think, for uh, to deliver better value for money and into the bargain the more people we get into employment the fewer people we've got in benefits which is a cost and the more people we've got in employment they're taxpayers and we get the double benefit of moving people out of benefits and into employment and the other uh, major saving that the government would make is that we would realign our defence priorities this government does not believe we should have weapons of mass destruction and we would reduce defence expenditure to take account of that fact the, uh, can I just say about Mr. <laughs> I, I think Mr. Swinney's a wonder. You know, whether the UK Chancellors, uh, firstly Alistair Darling, then George Osborne, have been borrowing multi billions. Uh, John Swinney hasn't borrowed anything over that period of time. He's balanced the budget, he's kept the books over a, a seven year period in the most extraordinary pressure on public spending that we've ever experienced. It's been an extraordinary performance. And, I'm sure that his colleagues have a few scars in their, uh, uh, that to, 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 to show it because that's necessary, but it's been an amazing uh, performance to be able to do that. Secondly, I'm just going to say, about, to, to follow up what Michael said, that uh, you know, when I was a, a lad in Livgay and I, I kind of stumbled across the fact that Scotland seemed to have invented everything, you know, how is it we managed to invent, you know, the television, the telephone, penicillin, uh, tarmacadam, uh, the fax machine, we actually even invented the overdraft, although we don't speak about that quite as much as, we, uh, as, as, as the other things. Uh, and I thought, how did we manage to invent all these things? You know, how did Scotland, which is a comparatively small country, how did we manage to invent all that stuff? Is it just more inventive, or, or what is it about? Well, it's actually because we invented the most important invention of all, and we did it in the 16th century, and that was free universal education elementary education as it was in the first Education Act in the 1500s in Scotland, the old Scots Parliament. We invented the thing that allowed all the other inventions to take place. And the reason we invented so much was because we had more people capable of invention because they were educated, and because they were educated, they were able to pursue the natural ingenuity in whatever field of endeavor that they were going forward. So, you know, that's why I've said when we took off student fees, uh, that the rocks would melt with the sun before I allowed children in Scotland to be charged for their education. And that is absolute commitment of this government for this time of all time. Now, sir, if I could turn to your two questions. Uh, like a Berkshire man, you get two for the, the price of one. Well done to you. Uh, firstly, we're keeping the pound. Uh, we're keeping the pound because it doesn't belong to George Osborne. 
Uh, it was actually a Scot that invented the Bank of England, apart from everyone else, but nonetheless, uh, it's not, it doesn't belong to the Chancellor of the Exchequer. We've built up that currency. It's to our convenience, and it's also to the convenience of our neighbours south of the border for us to use uh, the same currency. Uh, it's their, their advantage because of transaction costs, because of the protection that Scottish Resources gives the balance of payments, because apart from everything else, if George Osborne tried to seize all the assets of the country, including the, the Bank of England and, and Sterling, uh, then he'd end up with all the liabilities as well, which, <laughs> believe me, he doesn't want to do. Uh, so, and the, their, their kind of line on this has... Uh, has started to fall apart, hasn't it, with the various quotes, the senior cabinet minister, of course there'll be a currency union. Ruth Davidson, the leader of the Conservatives, only last week, revealing that she would be arguing for a currency union. Uh, so I think people are by and large seeing through that element of a bluff. So we'll keep the pound because it's our pound as much as George Osborne's pound. Secondly, on the, 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 the railway and development, and we've got a, a new stations fund, as I I suspect you're well aware in your community council and you'll be arguing for it, and I know Keith Brown will look at that very carefully in terms of the case you make. I'm an absolute passionate believer in this railway in terms of communications. I think we, we've got seven stations just now. We're going to look at possibly two others, and that's what Keith is doing. We need to make a tremendous success of this railway uh, and maximise its potential, not just for commuting, but for the communications and for making the the centre points, so all the other communities who are not on the railway line share in the, uh, in the benefits and maximise that amazing tourist potential. And then we can look at expansion. That's what I, and I've said that as soon as the, 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 it's up and running and we can have the evidence to show what a wonderful success it is, that is the moment to do the, the feasibility study on an extension. Attention perhaps, who knows, in time all the way to, to Carlisle because that communication would be, would be really uh, important. I think it will be the most amazing success. Uh, I had a fantastic conversation with uh, David today about how the council and the government can work together to maximise that opportunity. And I know that these communities are going to seize it with, uh, with both hands. There was a whole range of things which David was kind enough to mention and which I mentioned which are, I think, transforming the attitude of, of Scottish government towards these communities in this part of Scotland and that range of projects and flood prevention and housing and the, the range of things that are being done to show the commitment. But sometimes it requires just one project to symbolise a change. Uh, and I think that railway project is going to symbolise that change and all the benefits that can flow from it. So keep arguing for, for your station and you'll certainly get a sympathetic ear. I absolutely agree, and I'll tell you, it's quite a, it's quite a canny idea to make the suggestion just before we're moving into the referendum campaign. That's an excellent way, <laughs> excellent, excellent way to move things forward. Can I just say, so you mentioned the heart of the low there. There used to be a heart of the low there train running down the East Coast, mm -hmm. and being like you, I'm a heart supporter. Well. <laughs> I know, the, the only problem is that we're still in a minority. <laughs> But I will get a wonderful uh, name for, for the engine, and, but the communications and the connectivity, and believe me, I understand uh, that not the, there are borders communities, key communities, which are not part of the railway line at the present moment in terms of the network, and we have to have interlinkages to get people, so all of the borders benefits. But this is going to be an amazing thing, uh, and we should all rally behind it to make it a wonderful success, because the more successful it is, the more difficult it will be for any government to resist the expansion to get the full economic development to all communities in this part of Scotland. Okay. Un unprompted, the hands go up, that's excellent. Um, I can take, I'll take one from here and then come back to the side. Uh, Councillor Patterson and the chap with the yellow shirt on just behind and take one over this side. The lady with her hand up who's waving a pen just, uh, just in the back there. Okay, and we'll hopefully try and fit you all in, but certainly if you could, first, Councillor Patterson. I'm happy to hear that the First Minister is actually in favour of the, 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 the railway, uh, and, and, and I'm absolutely delighted. Keith Vance has got a benefit for the, for the economic benefits of the railway, but um, I, I represent Hoyt, and, and I really, I would keenly love to go back to my constituents and tell them there is a, a, a cabinet 100% behind the railway coming to Hoyt. Okay, thanks for that. Um,
if you could pass the microphone to the gentleman there. Thank you. Dougie Purvis, Selkirk. Uh, it's a question about equality in taxation. Uh, since January the 1st, uh, Green Wednesday, uh, the state of Colorado has raised millions in taxes. Do you think it is a positive or negative? Okay. For marijuana taxes. Do you, do you want any further detail? If you, if you have any more detail about the Colorado example, just for colleagues who are not familiar with it. Oh yeah, cannabis. Th this, this is obviously one for Nicola to answer. <laughs> <laughs> you might not like the answer. <laughs> okay, and we've got the lady, lady at the back there, who's waiting patiently. I'll, I will come to the others. Don't yeah. worry, we'll get in the next round. Willa Carr, I endorse the question of the lady about children from the least advantaged, the bottom 10%. I'm really concerned that we have one million people in this country who never vote. And I believe that information is power. And I believe that we do need to work very hard to engage those people. And I wonder what this campaign is going to do about those folk. We've got, they say, one in five children in Scotland in poverty. In some areas, one in three. We all know that in some communities, it's almost four in five. What are you doing about engaging those folk? Thank you for that. And if I may uh, just lob in, uh, First Minister, in relation to the question that Councillor Patterson asked, there was one Twitter question which was asking about what will independence do uh, to stimulate investment in the south of Scotland uh, more generally? So not specifically railways, but, but more generally south, south of Scotland. OK, then what, what we've undertaken to do uh, is when the railway gets up and running, we're going to have a feasibility study into its extension. And the, the reason I, I think, Councillor, is it, it's a good idea to to let it get up and running is because I think the success of this will exceed every forecast that's been made about it. And therefore, the evidence base will be there to justify the extension. Some of the route of extension, not so much the immediate route, but if you go, for example, go all the way to Carlisle, it's quite challenging terrain. It's, quite, uh, uh, it's going to be quite challenging in terms of the cost, but nonetheless, we commit to the feasibility study because you know you've got really got a fair wind uh, from uh, certainly from this first minister and from all the cabinet in terms of getting this done. And I think the right time to do it in terms of giving the evidence is when it's up and running and amazingly successful. You know, we're a year to go effectively, just over a year before the, the first trains will be running. Uh, the thing I announced yesterday about getting public participation and to making sure everybody gets, uh, gets wellied in and, uh, and right behind it. I think that's the, the moment to do it, but you know, you're pushing against an open door, so we'll get the feasibility study and make sure that we maximise the benefit, because I, I think it's going to, uh, I think it's going to transcend anybody's expectations. Uh, now, in terms of the overall development of the borders, I mentioned some of the things that I think are key. I've mentioned at some length the Tourist development will go alongside that, but the housing aspect to me is you know, what I saw today in Eildon uh, is a tremendous example of how you combine a private development with affordable housing to a substantial extent. Uh, and right up and down that line and the communities uh, uh, around it, there's going to be potential for, for communities to grow. And what we've got to ensure, because believe me, there's not going to be any lack of demand for top end private housing, we're going to have to ensure that that people who work and live in the borders can have affordable housing. And what I saw today was an example of that. Uh, and I was speaking to the families who'd moved out of uh, unsuitable accommodation into what are fantastic new houses uh, just beside Gala uh, as part of an overall large development and the various <coughs> mechanisms of support for affordable housing that are being mobilised in order to do it. So, uh, you know, if we've got the... And lastly, the, the Spark Energy is an example of the ambition that these communities have you know, if you'd asked uh, just a couple of years ago or two or three years ago what kind of company you know, can locate in Selkirk, you wouldn't have immediately thought that one of the challenger companies into an energy market would be the sort of company headquartered and based here in, uh, in Selkirk. But it is, and it's growing and growing fast because this is an, actually an ideal location for companies uh, such as that. Uh, so we shouldn't you know, restrict ourselves in terms of... Uh, of what the cost-effective base for a, a location here in the borders, with the right communications, with the talented workforce, with the available people, uh, then and the you know, commercial property prices, which are 
you know, significantly lower than, uh, than uh, Midlothian, never mind Edinburgh, uh, then uh, you know, this is an excellent location for that, sort of, uh, for that sort of company. So I think these things lead together, the transport, the communications, the housing for affordable housing for people, uh, and the, uh, the communications to enable companies such as that to, to locate in the borders of uh, Scotland would be my answer. Now, Nicola, uh, will you turn to the state of Colorado? Uh, <laughs> Uh, and tell us, I'm uh, happy to go to the state of Colorado on a fact-finding visit if you think uh, it would be useful uh, for And tell us what you've been thinking about the range of taxation <laughs> possibilities there might be. I, I understand this is a question about uh, the state of Colorado's decision to uh, legalise or decriminalise cannabis. Um, as the First Minister said in his opening remarks, he always uh, passes the difficult questions on to somebody else. Um, we have no plans uh, to change the current legal status uh, or classification of cannabis. Um, I think the reasons behind that are, are twofold. Firstly, uh, there is evidence, and I know some people dispute this evidence, but there is strong and quite mounting evidence that cannabis is not a harmless substance. There are links and there are evidence links between cannabis use and mental health problems in particular. There's also evidence uh, linking use of cannabis to uh, later use of uh, harder drugs than cannabis. So, you know, there's a lot of evidence uh, that it's not a harmless substance. And I think that's something uh, governments should be very mindful of. I guess the, the second reason um, that I would be very, very sceptical about any change in the classification of cannabis comes a, a bit from my experience as, as health secretary. And I'm not saying there is uh, an exact analogy between these examples that I'm going to cite, but, you know, for example, with uh, cigarettes, you know, and I'm not, before anybody thinks I am, uh, arguing for a, a ban on smoking, uh, but it's often very difficult with young people when you're trying to say to young people, don't smoke, don't take up smoking, it's bad for you, there are no uh, good side effects to smoking, it's something you simply shouldn't do. And very often young people turn around and say, well, if that's true, why is it legal? Why can you go into shops and buy cigarettes? Now, we are where we are with tobacco, but I think you get yourself into very difficult mixed messages if at the same time you're trying to educate young people about the dangers of drugs uh, and you're also uh, in parallel to that taking steps to decriminalize or, or legalize a substance that is known to have a uh, very uh, harmful impact so for all those reasons uh, certainly the position of this government is that there should be no change although I can say we will uh, for a whole variety of reasons continue to look very carefully at what the state of Colorado uh, does on a whole range of things and my offer to the first minister to go on a fact-finding mission, if he thinks that would be helpful, still stands. So, there's only one correction, uh, uh, well not a correction, just an addition that I would make to, to Nicola, that, that is I always delegate the hard questions to the women in the cabinet, I should just absolutely specify that. The lady at the back who, uh, who asked about poverty, uh, I've got a whole section here and this is my first ministerial briefing, that has all the details in it. I've got a section on child poverty. The reason for that section is, to me, one of the, the great issues that we've all got to grasp as a, a community. Now, there's good news and there's bad news. The, the good news is that, according to the statistics, that relative child poverty in Scotland, over the years of recession, uh, and this is a rate as numbers of all children, so just remember that, 2008 was 21%. In 2011 12, that's the last year in which we've got figures that had declined year by year to 15%. And I was from 210,000 children and families experienced poverty to 150,000. 150,000, you might say, is a big number. It's a huge number. It could fill Hamden Park. You know, we're opening Commonwealth Games three times over. So just think of it, and that's a lot of people. But it's less than 210,000, and therefore, over the years of the recession, that represents a significant advance. The trouble is, of course, that the forecasts are that if we go ahead with, or the UK government goes ahead with the changes that are being made to Social Security, uh, then that figure isn't going to keep going down, it's going to go back up again. Uh, and it's going to go up by the 50,000 or 100,000 children, depending on whose estimate you take. And a really significant thing about that, and I think for us all to understand that the majority of these people are not people who are out of work. These are people who are in work. 
And this idea, you know, it's all about sort of scroungers and dodgers and all these people, all those other people it usually is. It's not. The vast majority of these people is in work poverty. And therefore, there is in the figures two aspects. One, there's the Joseph Rowntree study, which was published by Glasgow University on 26th April, which showed for the first time ever, ever in any study, Poverty in Scotland was lower than the rest of the UK. Still far too high, but lower than the rest of the UK. And it was lower than the rest of the UK for two reasons. One was our different attitude to housing. That investment in social housing compared to what happens in England is actually hugely helpful in dealing with uh, levels of poverty. And secondly, we've succeeded in getting the Scottish employment rate, that's people in work, above the UK average by quite a significant percentage. But... It's not, as I said, just about being in work. It's about the wages people get paid. Uh, so if I had to say the two things which were absolutely best about what we've managed to do within the constraints of this devolved settlement, taking fees off uh, education so people weren't limited in their ambitions for the future. But the other thing, the introduction of the living wage, not the minimum wage, the living wage through the public sector in Scotland. Nobody in the public sector, that is to say the government, the health service, gets paid less than £7.65 an hour. Something we introduced in the height of the recession, and we were told it was going to be hugely difficult, wasn't done south of the border, but we did it. And a number of private companies are now like SSE, for example, are following suit, and that's a good thing. So we have to think not just about educational opportunity, we have to think about not introducing the changes which are bearing down in families, people with disabilities, people with children, which is going to increase the number of children in poverty unless we take control of these matters and do it quickly. And we've also got to reinforce the idea that people are entitled to a fair day's work and a fair day's pay. And poverty wages and the attack on poverty wages are one of the crucial things we have to do as a society. So if we can have the lady with the, the orange and black t-shirt on, and then the, the lady behind with the kind of lime green, and I'll come back to you, sir, later. And we have a gentleman over here with the jacket on. Hi, my name's Christine Dixon. As someone who grew up in the southwest of Scotland um, and witnessed the demise of shipbuilding on the Clyde, um, how realistic is it in an independent Scotland that we can have a vibrant, sustainable shipbuilding industry again? Thank you for that. And the uh, lady behind you with the lime green. Hi, I'm Carlanne. I'm from Dumfrieshire. And my question is about the police force. I got in Canvas and Annan, and I've had the, the changes in the police thrown in my face quite a few times. What are your plans for that? Thank you. And the gentleman here? Uh, David Garrick, Selkirk. Uh, the only time I've been told not to rock the boat was when I was working in a building on the other side of the Thames from Westminster. It seems to me you've seriously rocked the UK boat with this referendum. But if it's a yes, you will become the boat. Now, you're going to uh, finalise a new constitution, and uh, according to my understanding, there'll be three groups involved. There'll be politicians, professionals, and what you call Civic Scotland. Um, if I'm right, there's going to be something like an 80% turnout, which will be roughly twice what we would expect in a, you know, a, a usual election. And really, I would like to know how that 40% which have put their faith in the referendum are going to be represented when it comes to the Constitution. And what I'm worried about is if Civic Scotland really is populated by the same old institutional Scotland, names we all know already. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I'd like, uh, Nicola to uh, address the shipbuilding question, Kenny, the, the police question, and then if I can, I'll address the, the gentleman's question about the, the Constitution. 
Thanks, Christine, for your question about shipbuilding. It's a matter that's uh, very close to my heart. I used to represent Govan Shipyard, one of the uh, two remaining uh, shipyards uh, on the Clyde. Um, the Boundary Commission then got in the way, so I no longer represent that shipyard, but it's an issue I, I continue to have a very close interest in and know lots of people who work in the shipbuilding industry. Um, I should say, just as a preface to my answer, that as we speak right now, the future of Govan Shipyard is very, very precarious because BAE are currently looking at options uh, for the rationalisation of their shipbuilding capacity on the Clyde and the likely outcome of that is that they will move to a single yard option which will see uh, their operations uh, merged at Scotston Shipyard and Govan Shipyard close over the next number of years. So that's uh, a shipyard, uh, an iconic, famous, much loved shipyard is under significant threat as part of the status quo, not under threat as uh, a result of, of independence. Um, I'd make two points in terms of the future of our shipyards. Firstly, um, I think people should treat the uh, comments that we hear from the other side of this debate to the effect that the contracts to build the Type 26 frigates will somehow uh, be taken away from the Clyde if we should vote for independence as baseless scaremongering uh, because the Clyde will build those ships because it is the best place to build them. They've got the best facilities, the best workforce with the best skills anywhere in the UK. Uh, there is no other shipyard elsewhere in the UK that could, without very, very significant additional investment, build those ships. So, you know, I think we should really be very sceptical about some of what we hear from the other side. But the second point I would make is, I suppose, a longer term point. If we want to secure the future of shipbuilding on the Clyde, not just for the next 10 years or 20 years, but for the next 30, 40, 50 years, then we have to think above and beyond uh, naval procurement. Now, an independent Scottish government would have naval procurement needs, and you know, we set out in the white paper what our requirements would be for uh, frigates that would be built in the Clyde, but we need to think uh, bigger than that. If you look uh, to Norway, a country uh, not dissimilar in many, uh, many respects to Scotland, it's got, I can't remember the precise figure off the top of my head, but it's got something like 70 shipyards operating uh, across Norway, oil supply vessels, fishery protection vessels, things like that. So we need to think about diversification of our shipyards. Yes, uh, military orders are important, but if we want to secure the long-term future of shipbuilding, we've got to think beyond that. And we have opportunities uh, with independence to do that and to engage in some of that diversification. So I believe our shipbuilding industry has a, a strong and secure future if we're independent. But uh, when I look at what's happening on the Clyde right now, I question whether that's the case with the status quo. Kenny McCaskill's the, the Justice Secretary. Ken, do you want to answer the question about the, the police? Yes, well, I have to say, I think we've got to look at the police crime management figures that were out just last week that confirm that we are on a 39-year low. Crimes of violence continue to decrease significantly. The crime of handling offensive weapon, again, is down significantly. Uh, fear of being a victim of crime is down. Uh, support and faith in the police is up. The only areas in which they face challenges are in some sexual matters where a lot of it is probably down to changes that encourage reporting and perhaps publicity that's also uh, driven it. So I think the police service in Scotland is doing a remarkably good job. They do face challenges and that's why we moved to the single police service because if we hadn't, then we'd face the situation that's playing out south of the border where they've almost lost as many police officers as we have in Scotland. We've maintained not only the success of the previous forces, whether Dumfries and Galloway or indeed Lothian and Borders, we've built upon it and seen it improve and the service has been maintained. We now have access to specialist units, rape investigation unit, a whole variety, a whole variety of other aspects that are now available throughout the country that were previously only available in some areas and we've maintained the bobby on the beat. I do remember discussing here in the borders before we moved towards a single service with David and indeed other councillors from the borders. And I remember they came in with the local chief inspector and they said, we want Kenny as our chief inspector, will he remain? Well, he has, he still remains 
as the key focal point down in Melrose and elsewhere. Equally, I also noticed that the Police Scotland divisional commander that came in for the Borders and indeed the Lothians, uh, Jeanette McDermott, was so impressive to Scottish Borders Council that when she retired from being the police officer serving the divisional command, she's been recruited by Scottish Borders Council as a deputy chief executive. Uh, I think that probably shows the relationship that exists between the council and the police. So I think Scotland is well served by the police and the challenges that came with moving towards a single service haven't resulted in any diminution in the service to the communities. the gentleman in the Constitution. And I, I think he actually put it quite well in terms of uh, the, we vote on September the 18th, uh, and then there's an 18-month period for negotiation and for settlement before Scotland becomes an independent country in the spring of 2016. Uh, and what I've said, in, in that period of time, then we have to have three areas where people know that people are working together. Uh, the, the first in terms of making an approach by politicians on a Team Scotland format. And I was quite interested uh, uh, in something Alistair Carmichael uh, uh, said on the radio yesterday, the, the Secretary of State for Scotland. He was interviewed in Good Morning Scotland. He was asked a question and they, he said, well, I can't answer that because I'll be part of Team Scotland uh, by then. He was asked, you know, what would the attitude of the UK government be? He said, no, no, I'll be part of Scotland. Now, a cynic would say he was trying not to answer the hard question he was being asked, but, but a more generous person like myself would say, no, it's got into the logic that if, when we vote yes on September the 18th, then all politicians, regardless of party, regardless how they approach the referendum, will be part of that Team Scotland approach. Uh, and that's certainly what the SNP government will do. We'll reach out the hand of friendship to our political opponents and say the decision's been made. We need all of Scotland's political talents uh, pushing in the, in the same uh, uh, direction. But you correctly identified two other areas. One is the uh, professional expertise. We have experts in Scotland and indeed well beyond Scotland who would love to be part of this negotiation process. People of outstanding reputation, international knowledge, who, because of the part of a moment in history, have already said, and I've, got, I've already recruited a number of them, uh, I've pledged not to say who they are, uh, for, uh, for three obvious reasons, but uh, nonetheless, you can be absolutely certain nobody said no, uh, and they, they regard it as a, an opportunity to use their expertise to be part of what will be a very historic process. But the third area you identified is right, that's Civic Scotland, because this process is not something that's confined to politicians or experts, this has to encompass uh, the communities and organisations of Scotland. So Civic Scotland, the range of organisations which represent society, has to have a direct input into the negotiations and also the formation of the constitution. Now, to get right to the point, the reason why I have resisted the idea of saying this is going to be the constitution of an independent Scotland, remembering, of course, the United Kingdom is the only country in the European Union, the only country in the whole Commonwealth of Nations you know, we're going to be celebrating the Commonwealth Games, 72, I think it is, countries and territories coming to take part. Every single one of them has a written constitution with the sole exception of, uh, of the United Kingdom. So we'll be one of the countries with that written constitution, the modern constitution, which protects the rights and shows the, the uh, enabling attitude that a constitution can have. But in form forming that constitution, we shouldn't do it now. Why? Because the people who are against independence, by definition won't be able to take part in the formation of the Constitution. It's unlikely people say, yeah, I'm going to sit down and work out the Constitution of an independent Scotland when I don't intend to vote for it. So therefore, that has to await the first Parliament of the independent Scotland through a constitutional convention that the Parliament will appoint. Uh, and that convention uh, will bring about that Constitution of an independent country and will use all of the opportunity of modern technology to ensure the maximum participation. If you want an example of how that's done, then Iceland, the process in Iceland over the last few years, has shown how bringing a new constitution to Iceland has invigorated a country which was suffering great economic damage. So that's the, the process we entail. And the one last question is, well, what are you going to do in the meantime? You know, before you get that new constitution? Well, of course, we already have the, the framework of the Constitution through our own Parliament. We've got our Parliament, we've got our Judiciary, we've got the European Convention on Human Rights, 
which is embedded into the Scottish Parliament, which protects some of the essential liberties, freedom of conscience, liberty, freedom of religion, expression, and the rest of it. So all of that stays to be a part of a platform constitution. And then we'll develop the written constitution for independent Scotland, which will be part of a, a process by which the, the, the country can come together in a time scale, which means the decision on independence will be behind us and we can all set our shoulders to the wheel of building that new nation. Thank you very much. We've got time for three more questions. I'll take, uh, I'll try and split it evenly across. We've got quite a lot of hands up here, so I'll take uh, one here and two over that side, if I may. Uh, the gentleman at the front, and then uh, if we could have, the gentleman I asked, I promised I would give an opportunity with the, the cream shirt, and uh, there's a gentleman at the very back just by the shutter there. I think he had his hand up earlier. Microphones. Oh, you've got fire on, sir. Hi, my name's Scott McNeil. Uh, I'm from Jebra. And my question is what is the government's policy on fracking? Okay. And um, fracking. And, uh, yes. I'm James Pringle. If there should be a yes vote on September the 18th, what leverage do you think the negotiating team will have with Westminster, Brussels, the UN, NATO, and all the rest, given that you will be negotiating from a position of abject weakness? <laughs> All you'll be able to do is say, please. And if that doesn't work, there'll be no other tactic. How do you imagine you'll be able to deliver all of your promises? OK, thank you for that. And um, I think it was just a, so a lady on the back there. I think it was actually just, but we'll, we'll try and, try and to, if you're very quick, we can maybe get two in. But, just go quickly, if you're very quick, right, and then we'll okay. get the lady at the back there as well. Right, okay. Just to say, once, once we have independence, uh, will the level of medical research still be maintained? Okay. Thank. Thank you for that. And then the lady with the glasses just, just behind. The Scottish Government have already been very generous to the Violence Against Women projects, and will this fund then continue, or will it be cut? And Thank also, you. what you got to do about rogue bankers? Okay. Right. The, uh, can, I, can I suggest we, that Alec, you take up the medical, no, really Mike, you, Mike Russell takes up the medical research point uh, that uh, I then asked Nicola to uh, answer on uh, violence against women and Shona, Shona to answer against violence against women. As you can see, I'm in total command of this cabinet. <laughs> I'm going to ask John Swinney to answer Scott's question on fracking, and then I'm going to address you, James, from a position of abject weakness, okay? <laughs> so firstly, Mike Russell on the question of medical research. There are very strong proposals in the White Paper to continue with involvement in the UK research councils, but to do so on a position of equality. The research councils already receive, and there are, there are a number of UK research councils, including the Medical Research Council, uh, these already receive money from the Scottish taxpayer. About 8.8% of their budget at least comes from the Scottish taxpayer. And the money that comes back to Scotland comes because of excellence. It doesn't come because of charity. It doesn't come because of population share. Uh, decisions on funding are made what is, by what is called the Haldane Principle, which is that decisions on what is funded in research is made by researchers themselves. And the quality of Scottish research is so high that I'm absolutely certain it will continue to be funded because it contributes to the whole. But actually, the real problem with medical and other research doesn't come from independence. It comes from the cutting of budgets south of the border. So if we were to remain part of the UK, then the type of support we've given to research funding over the last few years, which has maintained its value, which has increased in value, which has diversified, would come under enormous pressure from the cuts that are coming and already coming to research funding south of the border. So in terms of state funding, uh, there's a group called Academics for Yes, a very strong group of researchers who believe that the best prospects are for independence to guarantee the funding that comes from the Scottish Government for the enthusiasm for a country that has five of the world's top 200 universities, the best research universities in the world, the most cited researchers, that that funding continues to flow, continues to do it, 
in collaboration, both with the existing research areas in these islands and on a much wider plane too, because research knows no borders. There's a huge growth in international research. Uh, major projects such as CERN show the importance of international research. So as long as that continues and there's many new agreements coming between countries, then our research base will go from strength to strength. We have more academics per head than almost any country in the world. And it is, so to speak, that intellectual firepower that will guarantee us a continuing place uh, at the very front of world research. I ask uh, Sean Robinson, uh, our Equalities uh, Secretary, to, to answer the question about violence uh, uh, against women and continued funding. And then I'm going to ask John to deal with both rogue bankers and fracking. Yeah, well, it's a very well-timed question because tomorrow we launch the new uh, strategy against uh, to tackle violence against women and girls called Equally Safe. And it'll deal with uh, not just uh, sexual violence and domestic abuse, but other matters like forced marriage, female genital mutilation, and some of the underlying causes about the way women are portrayed in society that can lead to attitudes that underpin Violence. So it's a very important strategy that will be launched tomorrow and um, if you look on the, the government's website you'll be able to have a look at that. The funding um, it will be maintained, in fact we've seen about a 65% increase in funding uh, for uh, the, the strategy um, going forward, so it's about £34 million that's within the system. There's going to be more of a focus on prevention though as we move forward. So the existing funding within the system um, is guaranteed, uh, but we want to give it far more of a focus on preventing uh, violence in the first place. And that's what you'll see come through the, the new strategy. Thank you, Shona. Uh, how about they put these rogue bankers down the fracking holes? Is that a possibility? <laughs> there's, there's an idea. Um, on on Scott's point about fracking, I think it's important to, to f frame our answer within wider energy policy. And the government's wider energy policy is to make sure that we are in the vanguard of developing the renewable energy potential of Scotland. So the development of um, the offshore wind energy sources, the um, wave and tidal energy support sources are very significant for the government in realising the full potential of our renewable energy sources. Uh, building on what's now a mature sector on onshore wind uh, within Scotland. So any approach that we take in fracking has to be taken within the context of our wider energy policy. On fracking particularly, um, the government has uh, commissioned an expert panel to look at essentially assembling the scientific arguments and evidence that can support any informed judgment about uh, uh, fracking or alternative uh, energy sources. I think it's important that we do that to make sure the debate is properly framed and properly informed about all the issues that are associated with the, um, um, the, with the practice of fracking and that we have, a, we have a full command of that information before we take any operational decisions to make judgments on any of these, of these points. And we are yet to get the final report of the expert commission, but that will be published and obviously subject to parliamentary scrutiny. And um, any steps that we take will obviously need to be reflected in wider planning policy. And just yesterday, um, Derek Mackay set out the national planning, uh, national planning framework and the Scottish planning policy update, and they would be changed to reflect anything that arose out of the expert panel uh, opinion and any government response thereto. Um, on Lady's point about rogue bankers, um, well, we've obviously, uh, you know, our whole society, our whole economy has suffered as a consequence of rogue banking. So we have to, the, the first, most important thing is that big lessons have to be learned from that experience. And uh, we are, are strong advocates of how that, how that should be taken forward. Secondly, we've got to be prepared to collaborate with other jurisdictions on the way in which banking practices are undertaken. Because the idea that somehow the financial difficulties that we experienced were a unique and exclusive product of Scotland is a fallacy that we're going on across the world. And the solutions that exist to the practice and the behaviour of bankers is to ensure that um, across the globe we have got the appropriate regulatory environment in place to structure the conduct of bankers. And finally, um, there is a, a role for the banking industry itself within uh, this country to take to establish higher standards of behaviour 
And one of the key advocates of how that has been taken forward is Susan Rice, who is one of my nominees to sit on the Scottish Fiscal Commission. She's led a process, as a very distinguished banker within Scotland, she's led a process of establishing professional banking standards in Scotland, and I think we should welcome that and support it and give it uh, all um, strength to make sure it's effective in the banking industry in Scotland. James, can I, can I answer you in three ways? One is a, a, a point which I, I think applies internationally. Second is a very practical point about the circumstances of the negotiations with uh, London, with uh, Europe and, uh, and the United Nations. Uh, uh, and thirdly, is something which I absolutely believe about the nature and how these negotiations will be conducted. And it's about the, the nature, not so much of Westminster government, but about the, the nature of the people of England, which... Uh, I've believed all my life and I want to repeat to you. The first is international example. Uh, the United Nations, end of the Second World War, had about 55 countries part. Now it has 195. Uh, about 50 of these countries have become independent from Westminster government. Uh, when I was an MP, as I was for the best part of a quarter of a century in London, I, I must have met every single High Commissioner for all of these countries. Uh, and some large countries, some are small countries, some are rich, some are poor countries. Uh, you know something, not, not one of these high commissioners ever said to me we're coming back under London Westminster control. Not one of them. They, they, they were, uh, whatever problems or issues or challenges their country faced, not one of them said, wasn't. Well, we're changing our mind. Uh, and I think we should just sort of set ourselves in the context of the change in governance. Uh, and I'm not making the point that Scotland is identical or similar to any of these countries. I'm just saying that, you know, Westminster government hasn't had a track record of people rushing to come back under its, uh, under its tutelage. Second thing I say is a very practical point. The United Kingdom has assets of about 1.3 trillion. And that's a very substantial asset base to which the people of Scotland are entitled to our share. It also has liabilities of 1.6 trillion. It will have in 2016 17 by the time that Scotland's independent. Uh, on the 16th of January, maybe the 14th of January, the, the Treasury, Her Majesty's Treasury, issued a note to the markets. And what that note to the markets said is under all circumstances, the United Kingdom government will accept liability for the debts, that's the bonds, the gilts issued uh, as debt and liability, under all constitutional circumstances. And the reason they had to do that, of course, is by the argument that the UK government's putting forward. They're putting forward they are the continuing United Kingdom. But can I just point out to you, James, that negotiations, we start the negotiations from a position that legally we are obliged to put, spend zero, to accept zero of the liabilities, that 1.6 trillion, it's about 120 billion as far as Scotland's concerned. Now, we're not going to adopt that position because we say in the white paper, look, there should be a fair share of assets and liabilities. But can I just say to you as a very practical point, you know, having conducted the odd negotiation in my time, you know, starting from a position where the other uh, side of the table is legally liable to all of it, ain't a bad practical position to start from in the negotiations, uh, uh, James. Uh, so that, that would be the kind of practical point I would make to you. But the third point is actually much more important than either the international uh, examples or indeed the practice of that negotiation. Uh, and that third point is about the nature of the, the people of England. Not so much about the nature of, uh, of Westminster politicians, of who I've had fairly substantial disagreements with of both uh, the Westminster parties. The, the social attitudes survey I referred to about Scotland a few minutes ago about attitudes to government. The social attitude survey also takes place in England, and in the social attitude survey this time, people were asked about what they thought about sharing institutions if Scotland became independent. And by a massive majority, people of England in that social attitude survey wanted to share the pound after Scottish independence if Scotland became independent. Totally diametrically to what uh, the Chancellor George Osborne is saying as he lays down the law, it's my pound and I'm keeping it. The people of England, no, the plain people of England, the ordinary people of England, when asked that question in the social attitude survey, said, no, no, but Scotland is independent. Of course we should share things, not just the pound, but other institutions as well. You know, a mile away from the rhetoric of Westminster politicians. So when people are in a referendum campaign or an election campaign, of course they say things with an objective of having an impact on the vote. 
that's what's going to happen. That's what's happened over the last two years. That's what's going to happen over the next 80, whatever days it is, until September the 18th. That is with the objective of putting the frighteners on the people before they go in to the polling station. But the day after the vote, then what will govern is two things. One will be Section 30 of the Edinburgh Agreement, where I signed with David Cameron, the clause that says the result will be accepted by both governments, whatever it may be, and then both governments will be obliged to act in the best interest of the people of Scotland and the people of the rest of the United Kingdom. That's Clause 30. That's what will happen. And the second reason it will happen is because it will be about not the politicians in London, or for that matter, the politicians in Edinburgh. It will be about the common sense and willingness of the people of these islands to live together as good neighbours, not with one group of institutions dominating the other, not with one country having the policy direction, not with, uh, you know, the situation we have now with, you know, I'm 59 years old, and you're all sitting there saying you don't look at it, aren't you? <laughs> Tell me you're all sitting there thinking that. For more than half of my life, Scotland has ended up with governments that Scotland didn't vote for. More than half of my life. Not in that situation of fundamental political inequality, but self-governing neighbours. And that common good sense of the people of England and the people of Scotland is what will prevail. That is why Clause 30 of the Edinburgh Agreement will prevail. And as my old next-door neighbour back in Lillivigo used to say, when Scotland becomes independent, England will lose a surly lodger and gain a good neighbour. Many, many thanks indeed, uh, First Minister, and many thanks uh, indeed to the whole audience here for raising such an interesting and diverse range of issues. I noted down we had the currency, public finances, higher education, rail projects, drugs policy, policing, written constitution, violence against women, uh, engagement of those who are disenfranchised and tackling inequality, uh, shipbuilding, uh, bankers, and indeed fracking. So we had a real right, wide range of national and local issues, and I hope that you found today's event both enjoyable and informative. Can I remind you that discussions will continue uh, over a cup of tea here in the main hall uh, just now, and we'd be delighted if you'd be able to join us. Uh, but for the moment, ladies and gentlemen, can I, on behalf of the First Minister and the Cabinet, thank you for coming along and asking your questions today, and I hope you have a safe journey home. Thank you very much.